Is your business getting left behind? Introducing Venture Map Elite, the complete AI solution for visionary CEOs. Get a done for you AI powered business map, three expert led training sessions weekly, and direct one on one strategy with top tier consultants. Don't have time? No worries. We handle everything for you. Just share your vision and we bring it to life. Take control of your future and scale your business effortlessly. Click below and join Venture Map Elite today. Are you a visionary CEO who knows AI is the future, but finds it impossible to keep up with the constant changes? Imagine tripling your revenue and automating 80% of your business operations without lifting a finger. If that sounds like a dream, keep watching because it's about to become your reality. Here we are. In this video, I will be showing you step-by-step -step how I put together a venture map in under a week. This is something that's taken us months previously and is actually done uh, in the wake of my co-founder of splitting from the business to pursue another opportunity. So 50% reduction in manpower. And I've got a sixth of the time that, I mean, you could say a quarter. So we were presenting venture map to be done in four weeks. That was a assumption. And it was an assumption we made on good evidence, but an assumption nonetheless, the fastest we've ever done it was six. That being said, I am a believer that fortune favors the bold and, uh, and, and we're at a certain place in this project where the future seems uncertain. What in, in so many ways I've talked about environment sensing as a capability for a long time and on recognizing the primary domains within our environment is so critical. The first one to address is market facing risk. That's our market forces. We answer that by establishing a series of offers on a value ladder that validate the desirability of a given value proposition. Once we have validation that our desirability hypotheses are correct, we can then heavily scrutinize and address our feasibility assumptions. The delivery hypothesis, the first question being, do they want this? The second, can we do this? That's important. People may want to go to Mars, but can we actually get them there? But does the longevity biosciences have the capability to deliver that promise? So do they want absolute number one priority to solve? Can we do that is close second, third, should we do this? Is it financially viable? The third domain of risk that we assess is the viability, financial risk. Should we do this? This is capital efficiency. This is customer acquisition cost to lifetime value ratio. This is unit economics that are healthy. These are the types of things that directly contribute to your enterprise value. When you consider starting a company, you have to consider how the life cycle will go. It's not just about starting. It's about knowing the game you'll be playing and for how long. Do you want to exit on your own terms? Starting isn't as important as finishing in the case of business. Now, if you're a believer in Simon Sinek and start with why and human-centered organizations that are sustainable and play the infinite game in a non-defined win state game environment, then fantastic. The company, even more importantly, requires your awareness over the founder's life cycle. If you plan to have a successful business indefinitely, and that is certainly the goal, we don't want a successful business just for six months or even six years, if we want a legacy enterprise that delivers value to the end users, to stakeholders, and is actually regenerative for our environments, follow on generations. As a father of two children, I can tell you I'm more concerned now than ever with the state of the planet and our society as a whole, as I know that's what my children are going to be growing into. 
So with those considerations in mind, we think the definition of a successful business is one that's growing. Now, there's more than one definition, that's for sure, but certainly one of them is a growing business. I would argue a, a, a stagnant business is not a successful business, even if that stagnant business is doing a lot, because it's not competing with inflation, it's not competing with upstarts, and, the, and those that are growing. Even if you and your, co your competition were neck and neck, if you say stagnant and they grow, now you're losing it based on a more objective, quantifiable, economically driven measures. Now, there's other ways to balance growth. For example, you could be growing within and there's cultural reinforcement and investments and all these other things. But just speaking to it in a binary way, if you're not growing, you're decaying. There is no stagnation. We need to be holistic and systemic in our thinking about growth. It can just be to satisfy the bean counters, the financiers. It can just be to satisfy the legal eagles, our, our attorneys and, and lawyers, though we love them all. It has to be for the holistic. So it can't just be maximizing shareholder value. It can't just be maximizing equity and inclusion and everything else. It is a meritocracy. It does promote and uh, reward performance at every level internal to the organization. And it does do everything in its power to maintain a competitive stance. The maximally competitive stance conceivable is what we want to go towards, just like Peter Th Thiel says, you, you want to pursue monopoly. You want to pursue complete domination of an industry. You don't want to be the sixth sushi restaurant in a small town. You don't want to be that 300th dude doing graphic design in a long list of people delivering graphic design. You want to be differentiated. You want to be specialized. You want to be competitive. You want to be in a place where no one else can be. You want to leverage the blue ocean strategy, market making technique while tapping into the EAC crush the turtle from finding Nemo pipeline of demand. So we're tapping into demand. We're tapping into real world consumers that are actually pursuing solutions to a problem. So we're speaking at the level of awareness our customers have. That's everything. That's essential. Okay. Family, family duty does tend to take priority over long form extemporaneous speak on the nature of modern enterprise. That in entrepreneurship. So moving forward, what's critical is expediency. Expediency will be critical. We must be expedient in our adaptability. We must be expedient in our production and delivery to market. We must be expedient in our stakeholder review and approvals and leveraging of new technologies. We have to be. If we don't, we're in trouble. That much is true because others are being expedient. This is a global world like never before. The competition that we face at an economic level, it's not with the other five sushi shops in town. It's not with the other 300 graphic designers. It's not with the other dozen to two dozen dominant peers in our industry. It is global. And if the visibility we have isn't global, we're in trouble. We're playing checkers when everyone else is playing chess. We want to be a dominant peer in our industry. We want to be the torch bearer on behalf of emerging technologies, commercial exploitation within the context of our industry. We want to be the catalyst, the narrative of Promethean chalice of bringing fire from the gods. We want to catalyze the next paradigm of operations for our business category, for our sectors. I have a, a dear friend who is a gunnery sergeant in the United States Marine Corps, Special Operations Command, Marsoc, his name is Dars, and Dars likes to remind me the priority that lethality has for that group. That in his, and, and in his words, he says, the only thing that matters is our lethality. 
And if you do anything to get in the way of that, screw you, is how it goes. And, and as you can imagine, Marines do love to share language in, in expletive form. So the same applies to business, not because it's hip and, and, and uh, convenient to, to synergize defense anecdotes into the private, private and public sector. It's because human endeavor has underlying characteristics that can be attributed to first principles. That's why we say as leaders, first, we make decisions based on principles. Why is that? Because the gray matter a few inches underneath of that skin on your forehead, the prefrontal cortex and the synaptic structures within combine with your subjective state of awareness and personal experience, bias, and worldview are generally considered unreliable. In fact, the main thing, the only thing in many cases that matter in a leadership standpoint is your track record. That's why as a government contractor, prior or past performance is the holy grail of sustainability, of actually growing a company. That's the holy grail is past performance. Because you can say, hey, trust us, we can deliver on this. Look how many other times you've done. That's the same in the business world, it's the same everywhere. It's an attribute of human endeavor. And that's important because human endeavor can be a Cro-Magnum uh, ancient band of hunter gatherers pursuing a mammoth, or it can be a crew of MBAs and postdoctorate researchers and mid market PE financers from Wharton and ex Goldman Sachs all around a table at the 80th story. It, it can be any of that. And everything in between and every other use case, not to mention the special operations, I mean, one I mentioned previously, all of which fall on a platform considered to be human endeavor. Human endeavor. Now, we could play a jargon game. We could roll out the lexicons. We could squeeze the vernacular. But fundamentally, human endeavor is an effective definition. Now, that matters because... In the category we're in, within the sector we're in, we're in the industry, in the market that we're in, we are also in a human endeavor. And the deeper we go, the more shrouded in ambiguity we become. For the gain we have in specificity, we lose a level of abstraction, clarity from a stratospheric view. For all of the many beautiful miles of continent we can see from the space station, we miss out on the individual mailboxes. When you zoom in to Google Street View, you can see the numbers on the side of the, of the, the homes. You can see the color of the garage door. And you can even tell what type of trees they have in the front lawn from a first-person vantage point. But when you pull out of that spatial environment and elevate away from that visual depiction that's at a very close grid coordinate or very detailed like eight to ten digit grid when you zoom out from the neighborhood to the city and state and continent and planet we have to abstract the along the way that's very natural when you're considering google maps doing it organizationally can be a challenge. Thank God for the advent and release of generative AI, the off-the-shelf toolbox that gives us the ability as, as servant leaders, as shrewd businessmen and women, as evidence-based entrepreneurs and fearless dreamers, and creators and operators and doers and executors as these individuals in the real world building value and delivering it to solving problems at a profit. For us, it means we can pack heat into the arena. It means we can punch above our weight class. It is a David and Goliath moment. The stones we have in our slingshot have the names Chat GPT, Gamma, Miro. Runway, 11 laps, speech of fire. The list goes on. Zapier, make, quick funnels, or go high level. We have the resources 
to be imminently powerful and effective, imminently powerful and effective, if only we can thread the needle. Imagine, if you will, imagine sitting down at the table to weave. There's no light. You can't even begin to thread the needle. Even if you've been in a seamstress for tech, threading the needle in the dark is an impossibility. You're going to sit there bumping into it for the rest of your life. However, someone comes by with a match, somebody comes by with a torch or a lantern, better yet, plug in a lamp and flip that sucker on, whole room is illuminated. That's what's needed to thread the needle, to begin the work, to begin weaving all of these disparate, fragmented, and in some cases, outdated tools together to produce a cohesive fabric, a fabric of reality, one could say, if you're tied into the ontological, uh, philosophical exploration of what is actually happening more on a fundamental level. If you think of it at a material level, it's our economic pursuit and exploitation of proprietary IP and emerging technologies intersection with consumer demand. However you want to, uh, yeah, if you it was more colloquial you, and high level, you could say trying to get rich or die trying. Thanks, Tripp, you said for that one. So, <laughs> I'm pleased with myself on that one. Yeah, yeah, Bakar would be proud of my brevet. Where does that leave us? Half the manpower. Quarter of the time. Oh, and um, one more thing. Let's, and in terms of investment level, 0. 0.0, those are the first two numbers, 0. 0. 0.0225. So 0. 0.02, a 20th, a 20th, the price. In one regard, this video could be seen as the musings of a madman. And it could be the story of a man who cared, or a husband and a friend. Aspiration to these recordings it is a message in a bottle. It's for posterity's sake. Inevitably continue to march on. The realities we're confronted with as leaders will grow in severity. It will grow in terms of severity. But I'll tell you this, nothing can change the abs level of truth that we're confronted with. The first principles. Having that absolute grounding in your life is like a flock being planted in good soil and fertile land. Learning to leverage our time, learning to leverage our attention, learning to become more of who we were meant to be every day is what it's all about. And by the grace of God, we can realize a increment of 1% back, 1% more. I wholeheartedly believe the importance reinventing yourself environment sensing at discernment and when we see the writing on the wall as it were when we see the direction things seem to be heading it's incumbent upon us as servant leaders to maintain the awareness the self-awareness necessary to make decisions and deliver what comes through action in the real world that are aligned with our values and objectives we're about to pull off here. No mistake about it. It is going to be a task, a series of tasks. That series of tasks is 158 deliverables, deliverables. And that's not including the duplication of things because in many cases we have a Google dog, we have a Miro aspect, and then we also have a gamma aspect. So there's, in some cases, there's three of each. So if I was really a stickler, I would say well over half of the total deliverables have that dynamic to it. And then extra 75 on top of this, oh, 225, easily 225 to the rules easily. And that's not refuting the actual correspondence that has to take place. If you were to tack in the bespoke correspondence, you probably look at 250 unique deliverables that are that are relevant to the end user in this case in a week. From the standpoint of a professional service, that's crazy. From the stand, a scalable professional service, that's crazy. Um, unless you're, you're netting multi-five figures. The, but to stick pricing 
along that, that is very, very low ticket as a professional service. As Alexander Osterwilder would say, is to innovate the business model through the financial area to basically innovate how we're making our business make sense financially. But this is a realm of maneuverability for us, and it's directly tied to emerging technologies. So I believe this pressure is what's required, and it, in fact, is advantageous for us to innovate and for us to be at the very farthest reach that we can, given our constraints, for the transition into a new technological renaissance. The transition we're currently entering into, and I frankly have entered into, out of the knowledge economy into the intelligence economy and realizing that knowledge is, is, is under a commoditization force that is so rapid that the, the most difficult thing is, is not the fact that it's going to be grounding out very soon. It's that people, the, the delay by which people will actually realize how aggressive the forces of commoditization are against knowledge. So to say that in another way, any information is going to be basically free at any time like that. That's why the simplest way to, to say it. any information, what information could GPT not produce, uh, assuming you're not a bad actor or of insidious character or nefarious intent, all right, all of, all of these, uh, important, but outlier cases. Well, the answer is nothing. Maybe there's some deep proprietary data that hasn't been scraped yet, but all of those things are fundamentally built on principles. And frankly, even if it's a book or if it's a new course, GPT can infer a lot. In fact, the amount of an inference, I believe, is tolerable for an initial draft is 80. I believe it's a 2080 uh, rule. Here. I think if we can gather 20% of the insight, we can deliver 80% of the product, the work product. So a lot of this is going to be concierge. If you're thinking about testing business ideas, it is a concierge test. If you're thinking about experimentation sequences, this project will be immense. It will be immense. And to accomplish it will be a victor in the highest regard. I will do my best to document the journey, not just for posterity's sake, because what happens after this is offshoring. And what happens after that is documentation and the processes, the SOPs, and the training data required for automations and AI to spirit the production for this. It's possible today. Validating it at the desirability front, then the feasibility front, and lastly, the financial front is critical. And then for those of you who really paid attention, it's also the fourth domain, which actually they don't even have in some of the books, which is weird. Uh, the books of people that actually wrote about it, they actually seem to have taken out a phase, which is neither here nor there. I keep it in because it is important. Now more than ever, as post-COVID generation rolls into the weaponization of weather and mass uh, psychosis and, and everything else, and this ambiguity increasing uh, deceptive warfare age that we live in, it's more important than ever for to appreciate if the idea can survive in a changing environment. The uh, financiers would talk about that as recession proof or, or uh, recession resistant at the very least. It's, it's not like a dry clean or a laundromat as an example. A laundromat would be um, perhaps not recession proof, but it would resist uh, the negative force, economic forces of a, a recession. And, and um, that's important. Another thing is geographic constraints. So we can get into adaptability and another, another discussion, but that's what I got for you today. Um, I love you guys. I appreciate you. And we've got a journey ahead of us. I will, of course, respect the confidenti the confidentiality and the discreet nature of the production along these boards, um, as, as if they are literally the, the genetic code for a company. And protecting that genome, that ontological data set is uh, very important. And data security is is uh, absolutely critical. So if you've got questions, comments, concerns for me, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one and the follow on tutorials or live workflows as I'm just banging this thing out solo with my old pal, GPT. Uh, always appreciate you and I'll see you in the next one.